Um, we have a series of lectures in My Health every year that cover health and well-being topics. So, for example, this autumn, uh, we've already had a, an evening like this in relation to arthritis, focusing on the physiotherapy, uh, on the medicines, the rheumatology, on the surgery, and then on the kind of research innovations uh, that are impacting bioengineering and development of, uh, of uh, better surgical solutions, better uh, medicine solutions, and better prevention. Uh, we've also had a very um, uh, interesting uh, session this semester on the medicinal use of cannabis and the um, uh, implications of uh, the availability of, campus, uh, of cannabis uh, in this country. Um, uh, as, and, and, and the experience in other countries to date, like Canada and the US. And tonight is the third in that series, and we're going to be focusing um, on inequalities. Um, and we have two passionate men here this evening, two men who are very passionate about the topic of inequalities, uh, and I know that you will uh, enjoy hearing from both of them. Uh, so I'm very pleased to introduce our chair for this evening, uh, Fintan O'Toole. Fintan probably doesn't need any introduction, um, but he's a columnist, a literary agent, uh, an editor. He's also, according to The Observer in 2011, he's one of Britain's top 300 intellectuals. He can explain that himself. Um, uh, I'm not sure after writing the book Heroic Failure about Brexit whether they would leave or take him off that list of Britain's top 300 intellectuals. Um, but, but you know Finton from his um, uh, Irish Times columns, those of you who are old enough from the Sunday Tribune and from in Dublin. And we're really delighted that Finton is going to chair this session this evening because I know this topic is something that is very close to his heart. So I'm going to hand you over to Finton O'Toole. Um, good evening, friends. It's lovely to see you all here. Um, in 1647, the English revolutionary um, Thomas Rainsborough um, uttered a great sentence, um, and he was arguing for the then uh, outrageous idea of universal male suffrage. Uh, not for female suffrage, of course, yet, but uh, e even at that time, male suffrage was outrageous. And his sentence was, the poorest he that is in England has a life to lead as the greatest he. Um, and it's a statement which is really at the very heart of our ideas of living in a democratic society. Um, the, the poorest person has the same life to lead as the greatest, the so-called greatest person. Um, each of us has a life to lead which is of equal value. That's why we each have a vote. That's why we each supposedly have the same voice in our society, because our lives have equal value. And yet we know uh, that the statement is, as a factual statement, untrue. It's, it's not the case that we value uh, people's lives equally. Uh, in, in most of our societies, even the democratic ones, uh, and that includes Ireland. We know uh, the latest analysis from the Central Statistics Office will tell us that um, the difference between your life expectancy if you're in the bottom 20% of Irish society to being in the top 20% is five years. That's five years of life. Um, five years is a long time in anybody's life. You know, it's, it's long enough to watch a grandchild being born and all the way through to <clears throat> going to school. You know, that's if you think about it that way, uh, it's long enough to plant a new garden and begin to see it grow. It's long enough to write a book. <laughs> you know, it's long enough to learn a language. It's, it's, a, it's a long time in people's lives. <clears throat> if you were to put it together, um, that bottom 20% of people, if you look at their missing years in, in, in that sense, um, amounts to almost five million years of human life that's not going to be led. Right? So uh, th this is a very profound expression of the cost of inequality. Um, inequality is damaging and dangerous to democracy for all sorts of reasons, and we're seeing some of those reasons play out in the instability of our democracies at the moment. Um, the promise of democracy, which is that we all count equally, cannot be sustained when people's lives uh, are being led on completely different tracks. 
But the brilliant contribution of our guest this evening um, is to be a superb advocate for an inescapable fact, which is not just that inequality is bad for democracy, it's bad for the body politic, it's also bad for the body. It, it actually profoundly affects people's health and their life chances and their life expectations. Um, one of the great things in, in David Ansell's work indeed is that he challenges us to undergo a kind of conceptual revolution. Um, and that conceptual revolution is to begin to think of inequality itself in the way that we think about disease, to think about inequality as a major vector of illness and death. Um, we talk about the war on cancer. We talk about you know, the, 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 the urgency of the need to confront and treat the things that cause death. Uh, and yet we know from so much evidence, and, and, and David is somebody who has presented that evidence with extraordinary power and force, um, that inequality itself is, is, is one of those things. And the challenge he puts down for public policy is really uh, to, to place inequality at the heart of health strategy. Um, and people don't get to be able to make that challenge unless they have the authority of experience. Um, and uh, Dr. David Ansell has that authority. Um, he's the Michael Kelly Presidential Professor of Internal Medicine and Senior Vice President and Associate Provost for Community Health Equity at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. Um, he spent over three decades, more than three decades, on the front line of, of the delivery of health services as a clinician um, as, 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 as a manager, um, as a teacher. Um, he spent 13 years at, at Cook County, uh, the, the huge public hospital in Chicago, as an attending physician, and ultimately was appointed chief of the Division of General Internal Medicine uh, at, at Cook County Hospital. That experience produced one of the great books about healthcare of our time, uh, County, Life, Death and Politics at Chicago's Public Hospital. Um, it's a memoir, but it's also a profound analysis of the way in which inequality really works in terms of the delivery of health care uh, for, for ordinary citizens. Uh, he then spent 10 years as chairman of internal medicine at Mount Sinai in Chicago. Um, and then he became the chief medical officer <coughs> in 2005 of the Rush University Medical Center, a position that he held for another 10 years. Um, and uh, his, his uh, advocacy uh, ha has been very much focused around uh, a, a passion for social justice, a passion for human dignity, and a very profound sense that as a doctor, what you owe to your patient is a sense of, of, of taking seriously the duty to see each life uh, as worth just as much as every other one. Uh, his latest book, which is, is uh, a really superb piece of public advocacy, is called The Death Gap, How Inequality Kills. Uh, it was published in 2017, and uh, I would highly recommend it. Um, so for all those reasons, it's, 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 it's a real honor to be able to welcome David Ansell to the podium to deliver our lecture this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, that was a lovely introduction. Had I known you were going to be saying such beautiful words, I would have done a better job ironing my suit <laughs> tonight. Now, I'm uh, really pleased uh, to be here and thank all of you for coming. Um, I'm a physician. Um, I've been a hospital and a health system administrator. I'm a social epidemiologist, but uh, largely I call myself a uh, human rights activist. Because from the beginning of my uh, days uh, as a physician, I understood there was some, something fundamentally uh, connected uh, to the act of being a doctor and to the conditions uh, in society, not just for 
those who've been uh, marginalized, uh, but for everyone in society, because we all suffer uh, in some ways by the systems that we create uh, around us. So today I'm going to uh, do a few things at once. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own path and story. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the history of medicine and how we think about disease through the ages and raise the question, do we have it right? Uh, do our, do, do our, uh, our, is our focus these days on sort of biological causes, precision medicine? Do we have it really right? Uh, because getting to root cause is critically important. And I'm going to move into some, a little bit of comparison, comparisons between the United States and Ireland, because I think we actually, both countries, are facing the same uh, contradictions or dilemmas? The margins are those who've been marginalized. And then the decisions that we make, uh, both individually and collectively, uh, how, they, how they play themselves out, are critically important for all of us. In the end, uh, for those of you who are in healthcare, I'm going to make the case why practicing social medicine uh, is indeed the work of, our, of us as individuals, practitioners, but our institutions. So this is my talk. Uh, that's me in front of the old Cook County Hospital. They're redoing the facade now uh, as they turn it into a boutique hotel. I like to say when the patients came in there, they weren't redoing the facade, uh, but I have no uh, disclosures. Uh, now we talk about the ideas of I'm going to talk, focus on inequality and a little bit on the concept of inequity. They're slightly different ideas, but I'm going to focus a lot on the idea that inequality itself uh, is something we need to be thinking about here. But I'm going to start with the ideas about medicine. So this uh, map uh, is the map of London where the deaths in the mid-1800s from cholera were occurring. And uh, I just want to, from the time of Galen to the late 1800s, our ideas about what caused disease were things called miasmas. They were ill humors that were in the air. There were things like spontaneous generation, that if you were near something, an ill humor, you could get a disease. And that was the prevailing thought uh, this is certainly in the uh, 1850s, when an obstetrician who attended Queen Victoria decided, uh, was, was curious, this was the second outbreak of cholera in London, and he decided, he had a hypothesis that he was actually partly an anesthesiologist as well, so he uh, began to use anesthesia uh, during deliveries, and he knew that the inhalation of gases themselves couldn't be at the root cause of disease. He suspected it was ingestion. Uh, and so he mapped all the deaths in, uh, from cholera in London, and the dots here on this map are where the deaths occurred, and there was a pump called the Broad Street Pump, uh, and he convinced uh, the city to take the handle off the Broad Street pump, which they did. But the chief medical officer of London said that his ideas around disease causation were peculiar and not to be believed because miasmas were the cause of death. They did, good, good for them, they took the handle off. I actually found a picture of Jon Snow. No, that's not the real, I mean, this is him. Uh, anyway, he was a very famous doctor. He was uh, sure uh, that uh, ingestion caused disease and not uh, miasmas. So time went on, and a chemist, he, he had the double, double negative of being a chemist and being French because who would believe a French chemist? And so this uh, chemist uh, made the connection between bacteria and disease. And this was in the 1860s. Guy's name, Louis Pasteur. 
of course, his ideas about disease were discounted, again, until about the uh, 1880s, when the germ theory uh, got propelled uh, into center stage. But what will people say about us 200 years from now, about our theories of, of why illness are caused? Because it's critically important that we understand, we understand this and that we name root cause correctly. Because something goes wrong in a hospital, if a baby is harmed, if a patient is harmed, we do a root cause analysis. We try to get to the root of it. But if you don't get the root right, you don't get the root cause right, it's going to happen again. So uh, these ideas uh, of illness uh, and causation have really been at top of mind for me since I entered medical school. And this is... Uh, a group of us in medical school. My mother said I would uh, grow into my nose, and I think I have quite marvelously. <laughs> Actually, this is my future wife. She's sitting in the audience there. She hasn't changed one bit. <laughs> and how she's tolerating me all these years, she ought to ask her. But a group of us, we got to medical school, and actually I found medical school quite disturbing because it was a time of great social change in the United States. Uh, and it was very, very clear that we had qu quite, as we do today, quite disparate social conditions. And somehow in medical school, uh, they weren't actually part of the curriculum. How could all of these things happening outside not have an impact on all of the stuff that we were learning in medical school? And during those, that first year of medical school, I was so disturbed by that dis what seemed to be, be a fundamental disconnect between my experience growing up uh, as a first-generation American uh, and the curriculum. And so I decided that I was going to quit medical school, and the town we were in had an agricultural school and a forestry school, and because I was a tree hugger, I said, I'm going to be a forest ranger. And I sent away for the application to be a forest ranger, I thought that would be good. Let me go off to, to the woods. But I met a group of students who were uh, similarly disillusioned, and we began to study the US healthcare system. And we realized at that moment in time that we, I knew that I wanted to be a doctor, but I didn't know why I wanted to be a doctor. And the group of us together came to the why, and wh the why questions in life are much more important than the, uh, the what questions in life, and the why was health was a human right. And so at that point in time, my purpose, my North Star became health is a human right. And so I had this bigger idea of what health was. Luckily, we discovered this guy, this guy, Rudolf Virchow, who is the preeminent uh, physician of the mid-1800s from Germany. And uh, for those in medicine, Virchow's triad, Virchow's node, words like thromboembolism, the modern autopsy perfected by Virchow. But Virchow did something else. There was an outbreak in Silesia region of Germany, which was a poor mining re region. So the miners there mined the mines, but they were getting sick. Why were they getting sick? Because they were starving. Why were they starving? Because they had the same potato blight that Ireland had. It was a couple years later. And 10% of the population died of starvation. And he went to investigate the causes of the typhus outbreak. Now, mind you, in those days, they didn't know typhus was an infectious disease. And Virchow came back and he said, the cause of the outbreak of typhus in Silesia was basically that there was no democracy in, in Silesia, that people didn't have rights. In fact, he made the case that human rights had to be equal to the rights of capital. He didn't argue that human rights should be more than capital, but should at least be equal to capital, and that you couldn't solve the problem of the disease outbreak without solving the problem of the lack of democracy, the lack of freedom. Now, he became known as the father of social medicine. He also said another thing 
that doctors are the natural attorneys for the poor because largely the social problems come to them. I was in the restaurant this morning at the hotel having kippers, which my father and mother from England, and my father used to make kippers when I was a child. I hadn't seen kippers in, in 40 plus years. And a woman came over to me and said, I heard you talk uh, yesterday at the graduation. And she told me that her mother, uh, uh, an elderly woman in a rural area of um, Ireland, fell and broke, broke both wrists. And they took her to the doctor, and she got both arms casted. But she's an elderly woman. And her both arms are cast now. She can't take a shower. She can't manage herself. They had to come up for the graduation. And there's not a social infrastructure. There's not an infrastructure in her town to support this an elderly woman who's now done things that a lot of old people did do, my mother did this, is fractured some bones. And now stuck, you know, because we've not organized the society to deal with the inevitable aging of, of old people. And so, you know, doctors are the natural attorneys, not for the, only for the poor, for those who are disadvantaged for any reason. And that's our job. Except that's not what medical school was all about. So that path led me as a medical student and a group of other medical students to go to Cook County Hospital because I knew at Cook County Hospital in Chicago, it was the ideal place to go. It had been disaccredited three years before I got there. Uh, it was about to be closed. We went there on an interview uh, and we're taken into a room like this and we're sitting in the back and the people are up front saying, you know, if someone doesn't do something, county hospital's gonna close this next July. And uh, of course, we were frightened by the prospect of going to train to a place that might not be open. And someone leaned over and said, what are you here for? I said, we're here to interview at Cook County Hospital. Oh, he said, you gotta come here. It's great. <laughs> but it was great. Everything I'm telling you today, I learned on that street. And I actually call my experience in Chicago, one street, two worlds. I, the hospital I work in right now is literally across the street. And uh, in 30 years working in safety net institutions in Chicago, hardly any of my patients got a joint replaced because the waiting lists or the lines were just too great for them to get a joint replaced. Yet at the private hospital, <laughs> If you limp inside the front door, you'll get a hip replacement in a re reasonably short period of time. Uh, and I call it the juxtaposition of these different uh, institutions really struck me when I got to Rush, recruited by this man over here, Dr. Tom Deutsch, former dean uh, at Rush. He didn't realize it was going to be so eye-opening to me because I thought it would be plenty if people like me just showed up in the public hospitals, that life would be fair. But I realized it was rigged. It wasn't fair. And it was designed not to be fair. I was, uh, got on the board of the public hospital system and the chief medical officer came over to my office at Rush and said to me, David, the wait list for the eye clinic at Cook County Hospital is so long, you can go blind waiting. And yet Dr. Tom Deutsch, who's an ophthalmologist at Rush, could see a patient today or tomorrow. You know, this juxtaposition of inequality was so palpable and yet so invisible. Yesterday I gave a talk to the graduates and I, about patient safety and about how if we tolerate unsafe conditions, we're promoting them. And there's an expression, what we tolerate, we promote. But the other way to think about it, we begin to normalize deviance. We begin to say that this is okay. Like I, I came to, to Ireland two years ago, and I learned about trolley, trolley lists. Trolley lists? Is that to get on the bus? No, it was people lying on, on gurneys in the emergency rooms for more than four hours or six hours, and last month it was 10,000. You can see a straight up line. How is this tolerated? 
you know, what we tolerate, we promote, and we normalize the deviance of it. And we do this, oh, listen, the United States is the best example of normalizing that deviance. One of the things that attracted me to Cook County Hospital was that the doctors, that's where I learned to practice social medicine. So this is the doctors going on strike two years uh, before I got there. This was a, a big attraction for me. Doctors who would, in the spirit of Verkow, take steps when things are wrong. So they went on on strike for patient care conditions. Uh, long waiting lines, patients waiting too long, services not available, uh, the most basic of services not available, and those doctors would not tolerate it. This was the longest doctor strike in U.S. history. I just want to talk to you about this gentleman in the middle there with the beard. I, there he goes. That's uh, Jack Rabo, he's a friend. Jack was a seminarian. Uh, who was on his way to become a Catholic priest uh, and decided instead to become a doctor. And he became the house staff president uh, at Cook County Hospital. And he got thrown into Cook County Jail for defying a back-to-work order. Think about a doctor who's willing to go out on a strike for patients. He got thrown into Cook County Jail for 10 days. It was the, around the time of a holiday we called Thanksgiving. Uh, and so the doctor didn't show up in the infirmary at, at the Cook County Jail. So they came to his jail cell and said, Jack, do you mind seeing patients today? So he came out of the jail cell and he started seeing patients. He, you know, but the shift was over and he made the mistake of instead of walking back to a cell, a cell walking out of Cook County Jail. <laughs> and he's standing on the, for, uh, the uh, California Street uh, in Chicago, realized he can hitchhike home have Thanksgiving dinner with his parents, <laughs> hitchhike back to the jail, and no one would be the worse for wear, except he realized that escaping from jail would be a felony, and he was in for a misdemeanor. So he actually knocked on the jail door, and they, <laughs> they opened up and said, don't tell anyone. <laughs> Many years later, I was a house staff in that same infirmary, and it, the conditions were really bad, and we went on a little strike ourselves and they decide to professionalize the staff and get a medical director. Who did they hire? Jack Rabo. As you could say about Jack, he knew the place inside and out. <laughs> he was the perfect man for the job. Many years later, uh, he's medical director of Cook County Jail. He gets a call, and uh, it was from one of his doctors. He said, I see a man here. He's got uh, burn marks all over him, and I think he's been tortured. And Jack went down to the jail on a Saturday and examined the patient in his cell with a flashlight and wrote a letter to the chief of police in Chicago and say, this man was brutalized by the police. Turns out he gets a phone call. It's from the chairman of the Democratic Party in Cook County. And the chairman, George Dunn, Chicago machine, said, stay out of it. But, that, uh, he, but this letter led to the identification of a police commander named John Burge, who on the south side of Chicago was torturing black men into confessions for crimes they didn't commit. And, put, and he put them on death row. Now I guarantee you, Jack was not the first one to know that this guy was doing this. Lots of people in the city of Chicago knew he was torturing people, and no one spoke up until Jack did. And Jack's letter led to his conviction, imprisonment, and the end of the death penalty in Illinois. So here he was from a mild-mannered house uh, seminarian, but he knew what he believed in, and he knew how important it was to speak up. And so Jack's one of my heroes because he practiced social medicine. So I told you my parents were from England, and uh, the BBC came to Chicago to do a documentary on county hospitals to show the Brits what healthcare in America was like with this two-tiered system of care. And they did a documentary called I Call It Murder. For your uh, entertainment, you can find it on YouTube and watch the whole thing. I'm just gonna so show you a little uh, bit of it because my relatives started calling my mother and say, is David okay? I call it murder, real one, final mix. 
our hospital is a hospital that other private hospitals dump on. And what that means is that any patient that doesn't have money, any patient that's drunk or disorderly, they send to us. Um, they often don't care what kind of shape the patient is in. We have many instances where patients arrive here unstable. Uh, in fact, we have many instances every year where patients arrive here and die because they were transferred inappropriately. What's your view of this practice? I call it murder. <clears throat> so here is a, something, uh, this idea in America, in the United States, that if someone didn't have insurance, they went to a public hospital and if they showed up at a private hospital, they would be put in an ambulance and sent to the public hospital. Uh, was true in the United States, actually true largely around the world. Uh, from the beginning of time, this idea was that the care you get is dependent on the card you hold or don't hold is, was the practice. Uh, and we didn't think anything of it. In fact, as residents in the emergency room, the phone would ring and you'd walk over and you'd pick it up and they'd say, here's where the university hospital, we'd like to send you a patient. And there was a clipboard, a piece of paper next to it, name, diagnosis, date of birth, and then the reason for transfer, and the reason for transfer almost 100% of the time was no insurance. We just thought this was normal. Uh, no one had to teach us this. It was almost automatic. And then uh, the numbers began to increase as the number of uninsured in the United States began to increase. And this was from the Chicago Sun-Times about a dump truck full of uh, patients being dumped on Cook County Hospital. And this is where I got my career, began a career in academic medicine, about studying these phenomena. And I, you talked about the study yesterday on surgical variation and outcomes in Ireland. It's really important that these not just be narrative oh my God, we got this terrible patient, did you see what happened? You gotta use data. And this is where, I, where the idea of practicing social medicine had three, these three important components. Narrative, the stories matter. Stories of patients matter, but data is critically important to tell the story, but then you gotta take action. And action is public policy. And if we fail to act, in the face of data, then shame on us. So we decided, my first time I do a study, that we would track 500 patients who had been dumped on Cook County Hospital. And the phone, uh, and then we, it took us three weeks to get 500 patients. Because this phenom the phen rise of the uninsured in the United States was uh, going on in, in, in that time. And hospitals f were faced with uninsured patients. They didn't know what to do. And there was actually someone just like me on the other side of the phone. And I used to think, oh, they're bad people. No, they're good people. They're good people like you and me and others just following the rules. And so um, we did 500 patients. We found that they were more likely to be hospitalized and uh, admitted to the intensive care unit. And the medical patients were, uh, had a much higher mortality rate uh, if you were transferred than if you were admitted directly to Cook County Hospital. Let me describe two patients for you that we had, because uh, this is the narrative part of it. Gunshot wound to the head, on a ventilator, transferred to Cook County, no insurance. Or this one, this is from my town, uh, woman in terminal stages of labor, 10 centimeters dilated, breech delivery, foot in the vagina, transferred to Cook County, no insurance. And when we wrote this paper, our OB colleagues thanked us because they saw so many women die in the emergency room of Cook County from being transferred to another hospital simply because they didn't have insurance. Now you can't imagine the w wealthiest country in the world doing this, but this was time-honored uh, procedure. And uh, it, w what I didn't expect is that the response at Cook County Hospital to this. So we wrote this paper and it was about to be released and we asked the hospital, would you do a press release for us I had never written a paper before. I didn't know what the process was. And they said, sorry, we can't do it. So we stood in front of a room, reading a little press release. And in the room next door to us, they had a counter press conference. And in fact, the first African-American <coughs> woman medical director in the United States of America was the medical director of Cook County Hospital. And she was in the other room criticizing our study but it was on the front street of the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, it got a lot of publicity. I testified before Congress, and as a result of this and other 
uh, uh, papers like this, the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act was passed in the United States, which made emergency care the only form of universal health care that we have in the United States. Now, patients still get dumped, but they get sent with pieces of paper, uh, and, uh, ambulatory-wise. But that, that was how I got, uh, that was my first attempt at actually changing social policy by leveraging data. Here's a, a second one. Uh, we study the problem of breast cancer. So when I finished at Cook County Hospital, I said, to stay on, I want to get upstream and figure out how do you prevent disease. And so we got into breast cancer screening. Certainly, it was a good thing to do. Uh, and what we, we, that was about 1983 uh, when I started. And there was no gap between black and white women in Chicago and breast cancer mortality. But over time, a gap developed. And we did this study, and we say, why is there now a 62% higher gap. And our hyp hypothesis was that it was uh, access to care, it might be quality of care, uh, things like that. But the prevailing hypothesis in Chicago was that it was biological, that black women have worse patho pathology, and so it must be a biological difference between black women and white women. That's how structural racism works. Uh, and we made the case that it was actually probably inequality and quality. And we got into studying variation uh, into care, in care delivery. No one, no one in the United States believed, I think, that a gap like this could be anything but biological um, and not systematic. So we needed to debunk the biological arguments about this. And this is why causation is, is, cr is critically important to think about causation. So we did a map of Chicago, and we showed the high mortality areas, which are in uh, green and one in blue. Uh, most of them are African-American neighbors, but think about neighbors of concentrated poverty, not race. Uh, so the, where you have concentrated poverty, uh, the facilities are never going to be the same as in uh, wealthier areas. And this is what happened here. And we mapped the hospitals that have accredited cancer programs. And you can see all the hospitals were accredited cancer programs were located on the north side of the city, and all the mortality was on the south and west side of the city. And so we asked the question, what were these women doing thinking of moving to these neighborhoods where the care is so bad? Uh, but actually, we didn't know that the care was bad until we went in and studied the care in all the hospitals. But then we showed this. We showed the variation between uh, the blackish Chicago mortality gap. And you could see there was none, and it began to rise. We can see the same thing in the United States. There was a gap, but it began to rise. And then we can show New York City. And we see New York City almost had no gap, and it began to develop one. So we asked the question, what happened to black women's genes when they crossed the Allegheny Mountains to come to Chicago? But was clearly that what we pointed out here was geographic variation in care delivery. We went into hospitals and actually got the hospitals to share their quality of care. And when you share the quality of care, what we found is that hospitals that predominantly took care of poor people had worse quality of care. And that was largely because they had less capital investment. They couldn't afford the specialists. The specialists didn't want to go there. Uh, and yet, they, there were people there who were providing the care, but the care they were providing was inadequate. Actually, my wife was, uh, did her residence, went, was a social worker, decided she wanted to be a doctor. We had two kids, did a residency, became a radiologist, became a breast imager, working in a safety net hospital, and said, I'm seeing Miss Cancers. A woman comes in with a lump. The mammogram shows a cancer. Last year's mammogram also showed a cancer. And no one would ever think that there would be that kind of vari variability in care. So I'm sure you see that in this country as well. We, ha we being black is a social construct, race is a social construct. Uh, it's a marker for poverty. So social medicine, back to this. Anyone know who this person is? She's an Irish doctor, Kathleen Lynn, who grew up a uh, daughter of an Anglican minister, saw the extreme poverty around her, decided she was going to be a doctor, 
but realized being a doctor wasn't going to be enough, that what was needed, what was necessary, uh, was Irish liberation and democracy. And, and she became the chief medical officer for the uh, uprising, uh, Easter uprising, sent to prison, uh, was going to be uh, shot until the Brits, Brits got embarrassed about all the murders, and then she opened up a hospital for starving children. And this was the New York Times at the time. See, think about this country, Ireland, that was under 800 years of British oppression and the lack of true democracy and what that did to the people of this country. Uh, you can't explain these kind of living conditions. The worst slums in the world were in Ireland, and this was the uh, New York Times headline. She started a hospital for children after the, the revolution and after the, the state was established to address the, the, the ills of, of children in, in Ireland. Luckily, that's not the case anymore. But this is the link between health and, uh, and social conditions. I'm going to move into this sort of this part of the talk now. I went to our board in Chicago and we showed, uh, we changed our mission from being the best in healthcare to improving health, and then showed this map of Chicago. And this map shows the life expectancy downtown Chicago, 85. If that were a country, it'd be ranked first in the world, think Japan. And this uh, neighborhood here where the life expectancy in Garfield Park is 69. Uh, that's United States, 1950. That's three stops past our hospital. So if we were really about improving health, we need to do something about the conditions in the neighborhood. It's not as if it rained on that neighborhood and made conditions worse and made health worse. Uh, something else is going on here, and how do we begin to think about this as an institution? You go seven stops down that blue line, and you seven decades of life expectancy. So that's uh, pretty extreme. It's actually more extreme if you look at small geographic areas. It's about a 30-year life expectancy gap in Chicago uh, between an, one neighborhood of 4,000 people and another. It's the largest in the United States. I point out Chicago here just to show you extreme version of what's true everywhere in the world. Uh, and if it can happen here, it can happen anywhere. And this, ha this has happened while we are ranked number one in quality, our institution, number one in quality in the United States literally three stops away, and no improvement in our quality in the hospital will address, uh, will, will address this kind of life expectancy gap. So here's a fact, and it's, this is where you get to answer. A 16-year-old teenager has a little more than a 50-50 chance of living to the age of 65 in this neighborhood. So what's the cause of death? Gunshots. See, we automatically go to that. But if you're, if you're, anyone do epidemiology? Epidemiology here, what's the number one cause of death in Ireland? In the world, heart disease, cancer. Actually, heart disease and cancer account in all of these neighborhoods with low life expectancy, same in Ireland, same in England, same in the United States, same in Garfield Park, over 60% of the premature deaths are due to excess mortality from heart disease and cancer, diseases for which we have all sorts of things we can do about them. And this is how social conditions, so we have to think about root cause of disease. I just want to go back to the map for a second. Imagine everyone in, in the world took, who had high cholesterol took a pill to lower their cholesterol. How much would you increase life expectancy? maybe a year, maybe two years, but imagine if you can really address social conditions as a society, what you'll do to life expectancy. So where should we spend, be spending our time? I'm not saying we, precision medicine isn't important. I'm just saying how we spend our time as a society, especially addressing poverty, is critical for health. And it should be the concern of healthcare. And we should be learning about this in medical school and nursing school and health science school. So th this is not far from our institution. It's a grocery store. Uh, it's a, I, when people say violence is the cause, yeah, violence is down on the list, but I call it structural violence, not my words, but Paul Farmer uses this. So structural violence. 
is structural because it's in the, designed in the way that our society works to benefit some at the expense of others, systematically. And I'm going to show you some more data in a little bit. And it's violent because people are harmed as a result. People die as a result of the violence that's created by the way we set up our structures of society. They can be modified. Ireland is a much more fair society uh, uh, than the United States, and so you don't have as great gaps, but you actually have the same things going on, materially the same things going on. So it's not just true in Chicago, it's true in LA, it's true in Virginia. When you go from a white part of Virginia to a rural part of Virginia, you see the same kind of life expectancy gap. It's not just a black-white thing. Uh, and it's global. So we've, we've discovered, then lost, and rediscovered this idea that Virchow presented in the mid-1800s as social conditions are cause, causal of diseases. And we rediscovered it again in 2008 when the World Health Organization said there's social determinants of disease. But I say there's two things. There's social needs. So a person comes in and says, I'm hungry. And then there's social conditions, meaning I don't have money for food. There's no food place in my, I can't afford the food. So we have to sort of break those things up. But this is true in the world. So the map on the left shows you global life expectancy through time. And you can see in the, in the uh, 1800, there was no variation in life expectancy because everyone was doing poorly. And as, as things got better, the global north has done better than the global south, and these gaps have increased. So in a sense, as life expectancy has risen for everybody, but the gaps have gotten bigger. And this is why we have to be historical. You cannot forget the history. So the history of colonialism, uh, the history of slavery, has left its mark. The history of even the, what Ireland went through for 800 years leaves its mark even into the present. Uh, is almost indelible. You cannot forget the historical uh, impact of this. And the, and the chart on the right shows you the difference in life expectancy, again, from the global north to the global south. This will only get worse with climate change. So the kind of uh, things that are going on in the world that are leading to refugee crises and things is only going to get worse. And it's really within our realm of uh, health uh, health institutions and healthcare teaching institutions to figure out how do we mobilize against this and how do we do better. So here's life expectancy. Uh, I just want to say, and depending on, uh, this is kind of the work of Sir Michael Marmot in England, that uh, wherever you are on a social scale, there's the upper end and the lower end and there's a gap. And you can see life expectancy, uh, uh, this was about 10 years ago, about a 10-year gap, depending from professional workers uh, to lower-skilled uh, uh, workers in Ireland. I think we heard an overarching four-year gap, but I think if you dive into smaller areas and smaller things, you're going to find it's going to be a bigger gap here. Michael Marmot says, inequities in power, money, and resources give rise to the inequities in daily life that lead to health differences. So now I want to get into looking at this idea of social mobility, because I, one of the most incredible things as you think of these toys we have, think of uh, Insta, think of Facebook, think of Apple, and all the wonderful things that come with this, but think about who's winning and who's losing uh, in all of this. So on the one hand, we have all these te technological advances. On the other hand, we have these widening gaps. So I'm going, first I'm going to show you from the United States, and just to make this uh, Easier, I'm going to uh, talk from this map on the left here. So on the left uh, is a map of black men and social mobility in the United States. And on the right is white men and social mobility. And I'm gonna sh then I'm going to show you social mobility in Ireland. Uh, so this is two Americas. Uh, and what they're saying here, if your parents made $27,000, which is the 25th percentile of income in the United States. How much money would you make at the age of 35? This is from an economist, Raj Shetty, who likely will win the Nobel Prize for Economics in a few years. And so he's looking at this. He's been able to link uh, income with life expectancy generationally. And I'm just going to just, for the sake of simplicity, talk about Chicago. So there's Chicago. 
So if your parents made $27,000, how much will you make as an adult? You will make $31,000. So what does that say as a white man? So that says you're doing a little bit better, but not great. In fact, this idea of upward mobility, which used to be the promise when I grew up, there was an 80% chance that I would make more than my parents. Uh, but now, that's not true anymore. And for a, a white man who grows up poor, he's going to make a little bit better, uh, not much. Look at the south of the United States, where yellow and red is bad. So in this part of the United States, people are doing worse. By the way, life expectancy has dropped in the United States. It's dropped in a, because white people without college degrees, largely from this area of the country, but uh, have uh, had a rising mortality, opioid epidemic, but also lack of progress on heart disease and cancer. So think about Trump voters for a second. Uh, think about Brexit for a second. Uh, with this so lack of social mobility, no hope that I'm going to get ahead. For a black person in Chicago, if your parents are making the 25th percentile, $27,000, you're going to be making $18,000 as an adult. So what we're seeing nationally across the United States is the lack of social mobility. People don't have the opportunity to move ahead. So here it is. Uh, uh, so this is in all the wealthy countries, this is true. And this is what this has. So basically, 20% of Irish who are in the lowest 10% of the income will make it to the average in a generation. It'll take five generations, 150 years, for an Irish person who's in the lowest 10, 10 percentile of the uh, economic strata to move up. There's no social mobility. So those of us who come from middle class, upper middle class families, and have had that opportunity, will likely stick with that. But for other people, there's not, not the opportunity for social mobility. Poor health follows. But actually, poor health for a society follows. This isn't good for any of us. So uh, Ireland is the most unequal in terms of market, and this is largely because Ireland's made a decision, probably a good economic decision, but maybe a bad social decision to give Im immense tax breaks to the, the, the companies here, and there because the workforce at the upper end is so talented here, those jobs uh, are high paying and they're good jobs, and no one should not have a good job, uh, but it's left lots of people behind. We've seen the same in the United States. Rising economy, the, uh, the Apple economy, in which people are being left behind. Uh, and we've seen this divergence since the 1970s in this. Uh, look at what top 1% of the income share. Uh, you've got at the top, of course, my country, the United States, uh, followed by the UK, followed by Ireland. So Ireland is becoming one of the more unequal societies. Uh, we're leading the way. We're the experts in inequality. Uh, and I can point out that, you know, directionally it's, it's, it's not good. Um, so Michael Marmot, uh, so I just read a, a trilogy about Roosevelt, and before Roosevelt died, uh, he was anticipating the end of World War II and not wanting to repeat the Depression. He was going to have the second Bill of Rights. And Sir Michael Marmot, the famous uh, British epidemiologist who's written extensively about health gap, has come up with his own list as has the Irish uh, Social Justice Institute, and I'm going to share them with you, they're remarkably the same. What Roosevelt came up with, a Bill of Rights. Give every child the best start in life, free education, including preschool, affordable living, healthy working conditions, including affordable housing, uh, guaranteed minimum income, uh, guaranteed equitable health care for all. And this is from the Irish uh, uh, Seven Basic Rights income to live life with dig dignity, meaningful work, appropriate accommodation, relevant education, essential health care, cultural respect, and real back to democracy, real participation in society. If you don't feel like you have a stake in it, if you feel like you're not going to go anywhere, this is where I think you get Brexit, where you get the Trump voters, you get uh, the social uh, dislocation that we've seen really all across Europe. So uh, Irish health care system, this is a map, was 
recently ranked the last couple years on a number of different things is, uh, I think, 31 out of 32. Uh, Ukraine was just a little bit behind on all of the factors you raise, uh, rate of health care. And it's not about money. It's about how it's organized and the priorities uh, that have been made. Uh, and I just want to just say there's a, a checklist that I have. So what do you need to have a fair health? Health care is not going to solve this problem, by the way. Uh, you've got to raise people out of poverty. You can't have 25% of a population in financial distress and think you're going to solve your way with health care. On the other hand, a fair health care system can go a long way. Universality of coverage with the same core benefits, whether you're, whether you're private or public. Uh, single payer, which I'm a big believer in, one payer, like the Brits have, like the Canadians have, is a fair system because if we all have to use the same system, we're, we're, we're not going to tolerate the kinds of things uh, that, that we have to tolerate. But if it's not a single payer system, no distinction in access or payment based on, based on coverage type, universal access to all hospitals and all doctors, regional quality standards. So you've got to measure hospitals by quality. You can't assume because an hospital has a service. Because in the United States, we have rural urban gaps, and I think you have them in this country as well, and then eliminate wait lists. So this is, uh, on, the, on the left is, uh, we've had this big debate in the United States, and this is one of my favorite signs uh, about no pubic option. <laughs> I'm definitely against the pubic option. Uh, and, uh, and here's the Committee on the Future of uh, Healthcare, Schlange Care uh, report, which is about reorganizing. Uh, one of the key points in this report, uh, in the second report, is eliminate pr uh, the dual payer system in public hospitals, uh, which seems to be uh, weakly supported. Uh, but I think as long as you have a two tier system uh, in which there's a, a different payment, for different people with different insurance, it's uh, perverse incentives for the doctors, for the hospitals, and everyone in the system. We've seen it in the United States, and patients will suffer uh, if you continue down, this, uh, continue down this path. The other European countries haven't done this path. Uh, they've done modifications of it, uh, but this path is both expensive and ultimately deleterious for health. So a final I've experiment been, that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, this, this became a very famous study and there's now many more because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with capuchin monkeys and uh, I'm gonna show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs and with birds and with chimpanzees, um, with, but with Sarah Brosnan we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber <laughs> is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the partner grapes, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, uh, thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is the monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us. That's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> she tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. 
Uh, and she gets cucumber again. <laughs> so this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. I'm going to end there. Uh, but the point is this, is primates, we, we tend to respond to our incentives. You could look at this as uh, the Irish Medical Organization, different doctors, private versus public, or you could look at even this as sort of what is it like to be on the short end, getting the cucumber versus the grapes, you know? We're all better off if we either all get cucumbers or we all get grapes. Uh, I'm going to end there. Thank you very much for your attention tonight. Uh, thank you so much, David. Um, I mean, David did um, describe the doctor as the natural advocate for the patient, and uh, I think most of us feel that if, we, if our lives were in danger, we would certainly like uh, David to be advocating for us. Uh, thank you so much for that wonderfully eloquent presentation. Uh, we've got some time for, for questions um, and discussion. Um, can I just maybe start off slightly, David, and ask um, a question I think hovers around a lot of this, this, which is when people discuss this, they say, well, okay, inequality is over there, and what happens in the body is over there. It's, you know, it's, a, it's a natural biological process. Um, in your book, you, you, you have a really, really good summary of, of the fact that you know, we're beginning to find out more and more about the actual processes in the body that lead to disease, and, and in particular, the effects of stress. And I wonder, would you maybe just talk about that for a little while? Because it's, in some ways, it's the bridge between the, the, the social conditions and, and yeah. the health conditions. Yeah, so we, you know, we, we've sort of separated out. I mean, I do think what uh, the question you raise is, what's the connection between social conditions and the biological changes uh, with inside uh, bodies? And there's been now a growing amount of research that shows there's a direct uh, link uh, between social conditions, especially social conditions of uh, poverty and deprivation and biological changes. From things like stress hormones uh, to uh, other factors, uh, uh, proteins and other things, we call them epigenetic factors. So it's not necessarily in the genome per se, but things that how genes are modified uh, by uh, the body. We've uh, recognizing even pregnant women. So adverse childhood events, you people have heard about those? They're called ACEs, and if you have more than three of them, uh, uh, they actually di directly correlate with poor health outcomes as an adult, but there seem to be intermediary proteins that get elevated in the body when human bodies are put under that kind of stress. It doesn't mean everybody will uh, experience it, but on a population basis, it really does has an impact. There's no other way that you can explain that there, the social gradient in life expectancy, except for s some biological mechanism. So we've been focusing a lot on the genome, uh, and a lot of the, uh, and appropriately so, because we make great advances in understanding, for example, the receptor for LDL that rate that blocking that receptor lowers your cholesterol and then lowers your risk of coronary artery disease. We understand that exquisitely, and that won the Nobel Prize. But what we've understood less is the biome, like how our bodies respond biologically and, the so and that interaction with the sociome. So there seems to be a clear, direct uh, connection, but because we haven't studied it as much as the genome, we don't know all the biological connections yet, but there seem to be direct uh, biological connections that lead to uh, these things. In fact, we in the United States, when you move a, a pregnant woman from a high-stress uh, uh, area where you could where risk of having low birth weight or even maternal mortality to a different area, and uh, that where there's a lot more social support, those women do better, and their babies do better. It, Given what, you know, you, and you mentioned early childhood and pregnancy, uh, I mean, one of the mysteries in a way of public policy is that you don't have to be driven by social justice, even if you're just driven by simple economics. The case for really serious investment in, early, in pregnancy and early childhood, in terms of the effects, the lifelong effects, and that seems to be absolutely overwhelming, and yet it seems to be extraordinarily difficult to get public policy to really focus in a consistent and coherent way 
uh, on investment in those early years. Yes. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, you have to say, what's the true north of public policy and for a society? And if it is to, I th as I think it should be, to reduce poverty, mm. you know, what's the tolerable poverty rate in a country? Uh, <clears throat> and versus, uh, you know, not being, being focused on too many things. Seems to me the purpose of society is to improve the life of its uh, citizens uh, and to reduce uh, distress, especially uh, economic and social distress. And so that means you have to uh, attack poverty. And the best place to do that is with that mother-baby diet. Mm -hmm. So I know in Ireland, for example, like the United States, you have automatic coverage until your si the child is 60 days old. Well, what's, uh, you know, I don't know if that is true or not, but if it is true, that's kind of crazy because uh, you want to wrap your care around uh, the infants. Let me give you a very, very concrete uh, uh, example around data. So we did a study uh, on low birth weight in Chicago and Toronto and uh, infant mortality in Chicago and Toronto. Both of them are North American cities. Both of them have three million people. Both of them are English-speaking cities. And both of them are on the edge of a lake. You know, you couldn't have two. Uh, and, and we looked at th the point we wanted to make with the study was to show that it wasn't inevitable that, that low birth weight was associated with being black. And so in Chicago, low birth weight and infant mortality is a direct linear association with a concentration of uh, black lives in a neighborhood. So the more concentrated African-American neighborhood you are, the higher the infant mortality. And therefore, the biologists say it must be genetic. In Toronto, there's zero correlation. There's a not, there is zero linear correlation. Not only that, the infant mortality rate in the worst neighborhood in Chicago is twice that of the worst neighborhood in uh, Toronto. And the lowest infant mortality rates in both cities are exactly the same. So we asked our friends in Toronto, what's different? And they said three things. Number one, you have wraparound health care your whole life. So your touch all of these times uh, in your life, and it's very, very consistent because of their payer system. Two is, if you fall off the tracks during a pregnancy, we're there to grab you, whether it's addiction or homelessness or something like that. And the third thing is universal education. So if you want to improve, if you want to improve uh, population health outcomes, you've got to focus on the mother and the babies. And, and so that is the, so health policy is education policy and, and it's got to be maternal infant policy. Great. Um, let's, let's open up. We've got about a quarter of an hour left. We have two ri uh, roving mics, so if you wouldn't mind when I point to you, just waiting for the mic to come. Uh, and yes, please, just the mic is just on the way, please. Thank you very much. I must say, thus far, life very well lived. I great respect for you. Um, you mentioned Sláinte Care. My understanding is that with Sláinte Care, it anticipates that public hospitals and private hospitals will uh, not be connected in any way. And in a public hospital, you will have public treatment only. There will be no private. That's my understanding. Yeah. I, I may not be absolutely correct on that. And yet, simultaneously, we have um, a €2 billion Euro children's hospital being built. And my understanding is that there is a part of that uh, project designated for private practice only. The, these two things seem to be in complete conflict. Yes. And um, certainly, as far as I'm concerned, I'd be very skeptical about the real uh, purpose uh, and intent in implementing the Salon to Care plan. The medical profession here, the consultants in particular, are um, very strong advocates for their own financial uh, amelioration. They're even talking about going on strike soon. Great, uh, thanks very much. Can we just put that to, to David? That's well, a great question. I, okay. I showed you the, how primates behave when given differential incentives. So uh, if there are grapes and cucumbers, you prefer grapes. 
but we've seen it in, in Chicago, and uh, these are good, pe these are well-minded people, but if you, if you give people a choice, they're gonna make the wrong decisions uh, in this. So healthcare is a right. Uh, this is my belief, healthcare is a right, and that right should have an entitlement, and that entitlement <laughs> should be uh, distributed across the society in a very predictable way for everybody, from the time you're born to the time you die. Now there's a limited amount of money, and what goes in that pot and how you manage it, those are society questions. But this is a society that's decided to give uh, uh, Apple, an American corporation, 12.5% tax or 6.5% tax, and decided to fund healthcare in a different way. These are societal decisions and how you balance them off. But anytime you, anytime you have, uh, both public and private together with differential incentives, people will always make the wrong decision and then they will tolerate what they're promoting. You, and you'll tolerate the structural inequities in a system like that. I don't think it's a good way to begin uh, children's house where you say one baby here, you go over here and the other baby go over here. Doesn't, doesn't seem right. I think you could have a public-private payer system if it paid exactly the same uh, to the consultants and paid exactly the same. I do think probably your public hospital system gets funded regardless of the quality, and I don't think that that's the right way to do it. I think uh, hospitals and services should be measured on their quality of the services they deliver, uh, as well as the physicians uh, and the staff, because I will tell you, quality varies not by the name on the outside of the building, but the number of procedures and the competence of the people in the, in the space. But I think, you're, I think the, what's similar between the Irish system and the American system is this, this balance between public and private, assuming they're equal when they're not equal. So I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a good public policy approach, given that there are so many other examples in the world of ways that it's done actually uh, uh, better with better outcomes and actually less costly. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna just take two questions together maybe before I put them back to David. So there's, uh, is there anybody? Oh, yes, so we'll maybe start over this side here. There's a gentleman here and a gentleman here. And I do wanna hear some female voices as well. Thank you. Yes, very good. How's it going, David? Oh, How's sorry. it going? Okay, we'll go back to you. Oh. My name is Dr. Carty. I, I'm a, I was a member of the, thank you, of, of the future of uh, healthcare committee, uh, which produced the Sloan Care report, and it, it had some some fundamental principles. We grappled with the problem of the Irish Health Service for over a year before we produced the report. And one of our f fundamental principles was treatment on need and not the ability to pay. The second was universal healthcare for all, irrespective of your social class. Uh, the, the third was a movement from hospital-centered medicine to community-centered medicine, prevention and pr health promotion, delivering care within the community and leaving care in hospital for those who had acute illnesses or who had chronic co complex illnesses. The fourth fundamental principle was referred to by our previous speaker is separating private care from our public hospitals. We knew when we produced the report, uh, the reaction within 15 minutes, the academic bodies, including the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland and the Royal College of Physicians in Ireland, supported us 100%. The unions, uh, the Irish Medical Organization and the Irish Hospital Consultants Association, opposed us instantly because they're representing their members. But the fundamental principle of Sloan to Care was universality the need uh, delivered on need, uh, our care delivered on need, not the ability to pay. So it's two and a half years now since we've produced that report. Yes, there has been some movement towards implementing some of the recommendations very slowly, but what we can absolutely say is what's happening in Ireland at the moment does not work because I just checked, I think there was 534 people on trolleys today. We peaked at 679 uh, a week ago. Uh, so what we're, and we haven't hit the winter yet, so what we're doing does not work. So we have to change, and it's a change of mind as much yeah. as a change of culture. Yeah. My question to you is how did you change minds in Cook County Hospital to treat people differently? 
because uh, trying to do it in this political system is very difficult. Well, uh, first, uh, kudos on the report. It's a uh, you know, national consensus report on how to move ahead in healthcare. If only we had something like that in the United States. You know, so uh, kudos to that, <coughs> to being able to put something like that together. I think it does provide a roadmap to move ahead that is truly Irish. But you do get the sense, I read the report, and I do get the sense of the uh, inertia and the reluctance uh, around making brave political uh, decisions. And, uh, you know, it's... So I said the narrative plus data plus action equals change. So nothing that ever has occurred in our country has occurred without some form of uh, social movement to move something ahead and consensus around it. And if the politician don't sense that, uh, th th have some sort of uh, collective pressure to change it, uh, it's just going to be hard for them, uh, hard for them to do it. Actually, what I hear all the time is uh, it being here, oh, we don't have the money. Uh, well, it's never a question of the money. It's really about how is the money actually distributed. I actually don't think they have the will to do it. The, the, the Butler uh, report, did I get the, the, the name? Butler. Pardon? The Butler. Butler uh, report, which uh, was uh, released with zero fanfare, no government officials uh, there, and with immediate op opposition by the uh, Irish medical organization. And so it doesn't seem, where's the outpouring of support for this? Here's the challenge, I think, for all of us. I told you the story in the beginning. It's, it's our parents. It's us. 2030, I tell this in the United States, everyone's going to look like me. Now, don't laugh. I know I'm looking pretty good for my age. But actually, it's going to be really apparent when you look around in 2030 that we have a, a lot of people who are over the age of 65 who are going to need lots of, lots of different kind of care, and it's not going to be available. Uh, and think about having your, your grandmother or my mother on a trolley waiting, as they are doing now, for hours and hours, when there's a sudden, sudden upsward, uh, upswing in the, in the population. I've sort of been relentless about this. I have just decided uh, early on in life that you've got to take a stand, uh, that you're not going to be popular, you have to be vocal, and you have to organize the support. And I would encourage this has to be part of some larger social movement because there's a high degree of tolerance right now, it seems to be, both in your country and my country, for the status quo. What I think will help move it in our country is the fact that a private premium in the United States for a family of four is now more than $20,000 a year. That's untenable, you know? And there's a big movement, and there's a lot of happiness with the public payer system, especially over the age of 65. But I don't get a sense that there's a lot of political will in this country right now uh, to make the changes that you've recommended in the report. And in fact, in the, when the section that says on the Butler uh, report says, well, we'll consider it. You know, the language is even, is even no, we're not going to do this. Uh, so I don't have a good answer, but someone's, uh, as we say in the United States, has to grow a pair. Uh, <laughs> Uh, thank you, David. If you don't mind, I'm going to take three questions together before I come back to you, just to let more people in. Um, there's a gentleman, uh, if we could maybe, yes, I'm just going to take the lady at the back, just want to hear a female voice, and then I'm going to come to you, sir. So uh, this woman right at, in the back row there, please. Uh, thank you. And could we have another female question over here? Yes, okay, so uh, I'm going to take these three, and then I'll put them to David. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, sorry. Um, thank you so much for your talk. This is really great. Um, so kind of looking back at your experience now in becoming a social justice physician, what advice do you have for medical students who, like us, you know, want to be well versed and want to, you know, be proficient with the social determinants of health and want to become social advocates, but it's not really super focused on in our cur curriculum? Do you want to take all no, no, um, so. I'm going to take this gentleman here, um, and could we pass the yeah. mic over this way somehow? So there's a, a woman over here as well. So, yes, please go yeah, ahead. I'm you. sorry, you've actually already answered my question completely. So <laughs> actually, I might just throw on the microphone if you don't mind. Okay. Cheers. Thank you. Um, I, wait, wait, would anybody else like to come in? Yes. So the, uh, actually, 
I'm just going to take the lady there and then this gentleman. So uh, just behind you there. And then, yes, yep. thank you. Uh, so um, I'm Alice Mary Higgins and I'm a, a senator, so working. Right. And, and for me, it's, it's, it's exciting to hear that link between the advocacy um, that medical, medical actors can do and change laws. And I just wanted to, um, I saw four, I think this is a key moment. You had the, uh, the International Parliamentary Union just this year passed a massive global resolution on universal health care. So I kind of think we're at a moment where Ireland's going to decide, are we part of that literally global push now on universal health care or are we kind of sticking to the, the two-tier system? Um, but I had, you, you've talked about the model of care the universal care, and you talked about that level of care that people get in different geographical areas, but just maybe two other aspects of equality, if you could comment on how medical professionals can be advocates on that, that I think are important. Uh, the environmental and social change. So issues, for example, about bad air quality is affecting communities differently. Health, you know, health professionals working as advocates to press us as legislators to address those social inequalities in environmental or social circumstance. And I was also really struck by cultural respect as something that you mentioned as one of those values. Yeah. And we know that in mortality rates, for example, travelers in Ireland are, have rates at 40, you know, equivalent to the 1940s for everybody else. I think only 3% of travelers in Ireland are over 65. So that's an example whereby there's a cultural issue maybe as well within medicine. And we know from the reports that there's issues of misogyny in medicine, there's issues of who gets listened to, who gets taken seriously when they, they approach. So maybe, so as well as the model, as well as the resources issue, if you could just touch on the wider social advocacy piece and the cultural change within medicine as Great. part of equality. Thank you very much. So we'll just take this uh, contribution and then I'm gonna come back to David, so thank you. Uh, hi, um, my name's Kate. I'm a, a secondary school teacher and um, I was interested in your talk because I suppose I work in an area um, with a certain level of, of uh, social deprivation and I'm very interested in, well, it would be interesting in your opinion on the role that schools would play in health promotion. Yeah. And um, interesting, I see the next um, public lecture is about vaccinations and um, I would just be interested to see to, to hear what you think about um, how schools uh, might have a role to play in encouraging access to, to healthcare yeah. and to, to equality in health, healthcare. Thank you very much. Let me see if I can link these three questions together. I can only hold one idea in my head at a time, uh, but I want to put these together. So, to the so this should be part of the curriculum within health sciences. In fact. I learned this uh, through my own practice, and the medical students a few years ago demanded, uh, called me and others into a room and say, why aren't we learning this systematically? And we began in our medical college, and now we're thinking about how we're going to create this as uh, competencies across the whole health science university. It'd be a great partnership between Rush and the Royal College here are thinking about this. How do you tr uh, actually train students? So we started a, uh, it's a four-year program in the medical school called uh, Health Equity and Social Justice Leadership, in which we teach the skills that are, uh, we think are critically necessary. So, I'm, so people like me are not outliers, but central to this, because we need physicians who actually know how to lead uh, in, in societies like Verkow did, like Jon Snow did, uh, and, and others. But it actually, there's, there's a whole set of critical competencies that can be uh, raised, uh, including when you're on rounds and the attending physician says something, what do you say? How do you speak? Right? So I think there's, to, the, to your answer, it should be taught. There's a whole pedagogy to it. We've decided in our own university, we've created an institute, we're creating an institute for population health inequity, and in which one of the things are gonna be, what are the universal competencies of equity that need to be taught through uh, the medical school? The second was, see, it gets to your question too. So I gotta just say, the, in, the, in, the, in the United States, the biggest opposition to uh, universal health care were, who do you think? 
doctors, American Medical Association. And don't think that a guild that's based on social justice, we take that oath, you take an oath about what you're going to do, and then when, you know, the issue around uh, financial remuneration and lifestyle, and I'm not saying there aren't problem, problems within the system with burnout uh, and uh, problematic systems, uh, but I do think that uh, we can't expect that the doctor community to be the front end of this. Many doctors will support it, uh, uh, uni the universality in a, in a fairer system, but you can't expect the medical community to lead on this one. It's going to have to be uh, someone else. But the issue of environmental justice, so this is about the social causes. See, if we, if we think the cause is the disease itself, so you have a big COPD problem here and a big asthma problem, and I don't think people really know whether it's only cigarettes uh, or not, and whether, it's an, uh, whether there's some other environmental issues. Well, that's the, that's the realm of study and understanding, but also social activism. We had a giant problem in Chicago with pediatric asthma mortality, highest in the United States, and it was mostly in black children and children of Puerto Rican background. Now, what would make speaking Spanish from Puerto Rico make you more prone to dying of asthma? And it turns out there are two coal-firing plants. And that uh, community environmental justice people shut them down. That sort of research is the research of medicine. Now, just like someone should do a research study on trolley wait times and harm. I'm surprised no one's done that. That's the patient dumping study in, in Ireland. But I do think that is that should be the role of medicine. Uh, and. Uh, <coughs> And there's got to be folks who are interested in doing that. Actually, a lot of our work and my work is partnered with the legislature. The, the partnerships we've had with public policy are di directly come out of the work. And we find public policy solutions that can make a huge difference in the lives, lives of, of, of folks. I just want to just say one last thing to the environmental stuff. And this is a society, Ireland, that escaped 800 years of the worst kind of oppression, worse, as bad as anything in sub-Saharan Africa uh, was, and look where you've come as a society. It just is this far away from taking this next step in healthcare and really addressing the fact there's a group of people in this country that are doing really, really well, and there's a, a group that's fallen behind and they're not gonna, they're not gonna get better without actually fundamentally uh, addressing that. And then to your point on, so we've decided in our work, if we're going to have an impact on the conditions, we've got to wrap our arms around women and their children. And we've got to be, we, we're not there yet, but here's what we're thinking. You can, every three-year-old and four-year-old in the country who comes in for a preschool examination at four years old, you can do, uh, you can actually evaluate them for readiness for kindergarten. And it's a, uh, a pediatrician can assess them. And zero, no hospital in the United States is this a required quality metric. But we want to make it a required quality metric. Can you imagine preschool readiness? I would like to see our institution have as a quality goal third grade reading levels in our neighborhoods. And the one thing that we've discovered is what gets in the way of learning is not necessarily just cognitive ability, though that can be a problem, is social emotional factors. And how do we begin to address in the school social emotional learning? And how can we as healthcare partner with us? So I think there's, as we look at how do we sort of raise up uh, uh, those who are being left behind, education and actually early education is the critical factor of who's going to succeed and not. So thank you for coming tonight. Thank you indeed. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to draw to a close. Um, just a few final remarks. Um, we, we have, in many ways, a very obvious task ahead of us. We, we know what doesn't work, which is the system we have at the moment. We know that it's incompatible with human dignity to sustain a system which is a two-tier health system, which says 
you go in one door if you've got the money and in another door if you don't and, and experience very different conditions. Um, we know that we have a gathering political consensus, as Senator Higgins talked about. You know, it, it's, it's the, the Sláinte Care report, which Dr. Harty also talked about, you know, has a very broad political consensus behind it. Um, what we don't have are two things. One is a consistent focus from the system on inequality. A very simple thing. Every year, uh, the Department of Health in Northern Ireland produces an annual report on health inequality. You know, trends in health inequality. What's happened this year? Where are we going with this? There's no such document exists in, uh, not just annual, but we don't really have an official statistical report on health inequality. It's just not seen as something that is there for the system to produce. And if you don't focus on it, if you don't, if you don't manage it, if you don't measure it, you're probably not going to do anything about it. And the second thing that we don't have um, is consistency in terms of programs. So we've, we've had some splendid programs. I mean, it's not that nothing has been done. It's actually even more frustrating. A lot of good stuff is done. It's done on a pilot basis. It works. And then we say, well, we'll come back and, and have a look at that again in a few years' time. There have been area-based programs, for example, in exactly the sort of stuff that David's been talking about in terms of early childhood, mother and child stuff, the Young Ballymun program, for example, which not only was shown over five years to dramatically increase health outcomes, but also to dramatically increase educational outcomes. So you, you, you could get reading ages in areas like that for kids going into primary school up to the national average in, in five years. This, so this is the stuff that can be done, but it has to be done consistently and coherently. Um, the missing bit, I suppose, maybe is the optimism, you know, that we're, we're so ground down, in a sense, with, with, with uh, a belief that this system, this chaotic system has grown up, that it seems too complex to get out of it. Um, and what we need, I think, is the sort of moral passion, the sort of um, authority from experience, uh, the sort of eloquence, and the sort of um, really fundamental co commitment to human dignity and equality um, that David has, has uh, shown uh, to us throughout his own career, but has also explored for us this evening. I hope and I'm sure that we'll all go away um, refilled with the kind of commitment um, that, that he has shown in his own career. And uh, for my part anyway, I'm just really very grateful to have been here with him this evening. Thank you very much, James, and thank you very much, uh, Fintan. I, I promised you two passionate men, uh, passionate about their subjects, and I think um, uh, they have delivered. Um, and thank you for a personally inspiring um, uh, narrative about your, uh, your own career and, in a way, living um, uh, what you're speaking about. Um, it is sobering uh, for all of us, I think, the, the uh, story you've painted uh, of both the US and Ireland, and we, we really also do appreciate how much time you've taken to understand our system. Uh, we often have international speakers who, who don't know anything about our system or engage, so that's, that's really, uh, we're really grateful for the amount of time it would have taken you to get some understanding of, of our own healthcare system. Um, I guess uh, if you think about, about um, cucumbers and grapes, uh, uh, we, I'm a psychologist, we're all psychologists fundamentally, and we all know about reinforcers. The people who are gonna get reinforcers are never going to say no, uh, so somebody else has to change the uh, the, 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 what's, the re, what's reinforcing in society and uh, so on. I think the other thing that, um, uh, just to mention, you, you mentioned <coughs> Kathleen Lynn, and I've, I've never seen those photographs. They're really quite amazing uh, photographs, particularly the picture pointing out that it's Dublin and not China or India. Uh, for those historians in the room, and I know David gave the college lecture across the street in one of the old um, wooden lined rooms uh, two years ago. That's the room that Kathleen Lynn spent most of 1916 in with Countess Markovic uh, in, in a kind of a field hospital there um, as, as the chief medical officer of the Irish Citizen Army, just for the, the, those, those historians. But I mean, she went on to found uh, St. Alton's Children's Hospital up at Charlemagne Street because of the state of poverty for children in the area. And what's really interesting and maybe holds the light up to us is that many of us admire concern 
which is a, a national charity uh, that was founded more than 40 years ago, looking at, the, at, at Biafra. But they have gone upstream, is your language, uh, over time. And they have a campaign now called The First Thousand Days. And it's about saying, if you can get children to age three, having a healthy start in life by looking after mothers, um, you, you are going to change society. And it's sort of ironic that um, uh, Concern do that for what we call the Global South, uh, when we actually need some of that uh, uh, maybe uh, here for ourselves. Uh, if, if there's anything that might uh, help to trigger us a, a bit along this path um, that, that uh, Fintan talked about in terms of optimism, uh, is I think that we're a country who, who works well uh, in relation to pride. We like to be proud of uh, things Irish, whether it's in sports uh, or the arts or whatever. Uh, and I think there is no pride to be worst in the OECD. And I think we have to keep reminding ourselves of those very stark statistics uh, to shame ourselves out of being second from bottom in, in, uh, in, in the league in Europe or in, in wider OECD circles. Um, so uh, I hope you found some inspiration tonight from uh, listening to what David's done. I think sometimes it's walking the walk all day, every day. Uh, not the dramatic moves sometimes that are, are really the things that turn the dial. I hope some of the students in the audience uh, feel inspired uh, to, to uh, working for and in a better healthcare system. And I guess for all of us who are all going to be that person who uh, maybe falls over and breaks both wrists when they're 80, um, uh, that we use the momentum of, of David's inspiring talk this evening to think about how do we start to turn the dial and make things better. Thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. And uh, again, thank you very much to David for traveling and for talking to us. <laughs>